Okay. I think we'll get started now. And uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Jim Puckett. I'm the founder and director of the Basel Action Network. And uh, the Basel Action Network, of course, owns and operates the eStewards Electronic Waste Certification Program for uh, responsible and ethical recycling of electronic waste. Uh, today, we've gotten a lot of registrants. Over 600 have registered for this webinar, and we sure hope that they can all um, log in and be a part of it. The program will be recorded so that it can be downloaded later and uh, people can access that freely. Um, without further ado, I'm going to get started and introduce our speakers today. Uh, I've introduced myself and we have also Craig Thompson, who's calling, coming to us from the UK and he's the Director of Global Business Development at FPD. We also have Steve Wong, the CEO of Fukutomi Recycling. And we have Jeff Lloyd, VP of Sales and Marketing at URT LLC. Both Steve and Jeff are coming from the United States, as am I. I'm over here in Seattle, where it's still pretty early in the morning at 9 a.m. Today's program, we're going to, uh, I'm gonna start off and talk about the new rules why they exist, what they are, and who they affect. And then we'll have the electronics recycler panelists speak about their situation and how it's impacted them and how they're responding to it. And then we're gonna open it up, not for questions first off, but for other experiences from the floor, from anybody that has uh, also had the challenge of responding to the new rules. And then we'll open it up to questions and answers. And when we get to that point, I'll explain how the Q&A will, will work. But on the other experiences from the floor, all you need to do is uh, raise your hand and indicate that you have something to contribute. So let's get started. First thing I want to tell you is a little bit about the Basel Convention, because that's where these rules are coming from. It's the world's only convention or treaty on waste. It was created back in 1989. Um, it's got 188 parties to date, which is a good chunk of the world, as we'll see. And Basel Action Network, myself, I've been involved since the very beginning, uh, but the BAN organization has been very active since 1997. So what does Basel do? It's primarily there to protect developing countries from the abuses of hazardous waste exported to them from developed countries. And it has soft law aspects, which are very important. And we call them soft law because people are usually not going to get arrested and put in jail for these kinds of things, but it's general obligations on the countries. So it calls for national self-sufficiency in waste management. Every country should take care of their own waste. It calls for minimizing all forms of transboundary movement of hazardous and other waste. It calls for minimizing the generation of hazardous and other waste. And it calls for ensuring environmentally sound management of that waste which is produced. Now, the hard law aspects are indeed the things that could get people in trouble through violations and uh, could actually be criminally charged for violations within a Basel party. So the hard law aspects define and control certain wastes. And under the convention, the ones that are controlled are in two categories. They're either hazardous waste or they're called other wastes and those other wastes are defined in Annex 2. So the hazardous wastes are defined in Annexes 1, 3, and 8. They're also defined according to national law. 
so a country can say we think something is a hazardous waste and all the other countries have to respect that and then the other waste is found in annex two and these are called wastes for special consideration doesn't mean they're hazardous but they still will be controlled and right now there's three categories uh, prior to these new amendments there were only two categories of other waste and those two were waste collected from households incinerator ashes from incinerating household waste and now we have a new third category or listing and these are certain plastic wastes and that's the famous Y48 category, which we'll spend most of the time talking about today. So the controls that are required in the hard law on these hazardous and other wastes are usually notification and consent. So that's the default control. It's often called prior informed consent or PIC, and it's laid out in Article 6 how that should take place. But it's basically before you send your waste, you have to notify the country that's aiming to receive it and get their consent, and then it can go. And without that procedure in place, it's criminal. It's criminal illegal trafficking. Then there's also other controls, which are bans, and these are also found in the convention. Countries can ban imports on a national basis, as China did with a lot of their waste, for example. There's also a ban on export to Antarctica, which uh, nobody has been trying to do, hopefully. And then there's a ban on trade between parties and non-parties. And this is a ban unless you have a special Article 11 agreement between the countries that are non-parties and parties, then it's prohibited to train, trade with a non-party. This is very important because the US is a non-party and they are a major player. And then there's another ban, the Basel Ban Amendment, which bans uh, the export from developed to developing countries of all hazardous waste for any reason. And that entered into force in 2019. So the convention, as I mentioned, has 188 parties. Uh, one of those parties is the EU, so we don't count that as a country. But 187 countries are members. And so I made this map of uh, the reverse of what you would normally do. I, I indicated the non-parties because the rest of the world, all of the gray part is part of this convention. And so you see very glaringly, there's only eight countries that are United Nations countries that are not part of it. Most of them are tiny and don't show up. But you see very glaringly, we have the United States um, as one of the eight, together with East Timor, Grenada, Fiji, Haiti, San Marino, the Solomon Islands, South Sudan, and the US. So this creates a tremendous problem uh, in the governance because we have the world's most wasteful country per capita, the US, not part of this important treaty. Originally, in the beginning, the treaty was written and was designed to handle what we call factory waste directly out of manufacturing processes. Uh, and that's how it was designed. But since the last two decades or so, we're seeing more and more that the waste that are causing problems are post-consumer waste. So waste that passes through usage, usually through you and me as consumers. And this can involve electronic waste trade, which is currently very problematic and is going to Africa and Asia. It also involves old ships. After they've been used, these old ships are dumped on South Asian beaches. And that's another form of post-consumer waste, very hazardous. And then most recently, the awareness has been raised about the plastic waste trade. And most of this currently is going to Southeast Asia 
but things as we will talk about are much in flux and this could change. So why do we have these plastic amendments? What happened? Why did the Basel Convention decide to start controlling plastics? Well, the very first thing that really woke everyone up, the driver for these amendments was when China, which was taking the lion's share of the waste of the world in terms of plastics and other scrap. China, as of March 2018, said no more. Their national sword policy, uh, together with very strict and uh, in very um, aggressive enforcement, has made it almost impossible to bring anything into China. And they said, we don't want any plastic scrap unless the purity level was 99.5% of the target recyclable polymer. This move by China, because nobody could reach that 99.5%, the market was not geared to do that, created a real chaotic situation globally. And we started seeing the waste that used to go to China flying off in other directions. So in China, there was a film which was instrumental in making this ban in China uh, pass. And it was called Plastic China, which really showed the problems, finally, of all these plastic waste that for years had been going to China. It really focused in on a village and the impacts in that village on the livelihoods and the lives of the inhabitants and their children. Very powerful film. And since that time, after they passed the national sword, you can see the before and after. These columns on the left-hand side of each column indicate the G7 countries, which were doing most of the exporting to China. And so you see that in 2017, China imports were about 60% of G7 plastic waste. If you count Hong Kong and China, that's where most of it was going, 60%. And after the ban went into place, less than 10% of the G7 plastic waste was ending up in China. And it may be even less today because China has aggressively uh, been enforcing this ban. And after that China ban, most of the materials started going to Southeast Asia. In fact, the very Chinese businessmen that used to bring it in to China moved down to countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Thailand and set up shop there. They often set up the shop in places that were rural farmland. And most of this waste that they were importing was not recyclable, only some of it, some of the fraction could be recycled. And therefore it was dumped. And very often after the dumps became problematic, it was set aflame and burned. And this is happening today. So this became more and more well known and it was a huge driver. Um, the other big issue that is undeniable as part of the driver was the focus on the marine pollution by plastics. Multiple discoveries of the situation in our oceans created great alarm all over the world that we were actually getting to a point where we had more plastic than fish by mass in the sea. Uh, this became a well-known factoid that this was what we could expect, the way things were going. And everyone had seen their beaches looking like this all over the world. And uh, it reached a critical point where people said enough is enough. What can we do about it? And so the other aspect here is that Basel was a convention uh, treaty that already existed, the only treaty on waste. And so while many people were thinking we need a special treaty on plastics, and we probably do eventually, if not sooner, uh, Basel already existed and could, could do much to control the trade in plastics and bring it under control. So this was the reason for the amendments. And they passed in 14 May 2019 at the Fourth Conference of Parties, probably the fastest um, adoption of agreements I've ever seen in the Basel Convention or in international law. It moved from concept to reality in about nine months, and it was proposed by the Norwegians. It had a great many advocates. Almost every country was supportive. Africans were absolutely supportive of the EU, Asia Pacific, even Japan, which usually doesn't go along with these types of things. China very much behind 
uh, the agreement. The only countries opposing really was the United States, which is a non-party, and they had countries voicing uh, the U.S. position in Brazil and Argentina. But it was such an overwhelming uh, force that the amendments were quickly adopted by consensus. So the intention of the, the amendments are to ensure control and transparency of transboundary movements of plastic waste that are not likely to be recycled in a proper way. So not all plastic waste, but the ones that are causing problems currently in Southeast Asia primarily. So these are plastic waste mixtures. These are contaminated plastic waste. These are halogenated polymers, for example, PVC. The default control provided would be prior informed consent. And it requires notifying by exporting country and consent of importing country. And there must be assurances of environmentally sound management, regardless of whether the waste is allowed or not. You have to make sure it's going to be environmentally sound management. And failure to comply is going to be considered illegal traffic and a criminal act. So it's very important to know what the wastes are that are going to be controlled. These are new listings that have come into force this year as of January 1 of this month. And the way to look at it is which ones are not going to apply, which ones are going to be exempt from the controls because the way the amendments are crafted is everything that's not exempt is going to be controlled. So these are the exemptions. First, we have plastic waste, almost exclusively consisting of one non-halogenated polymer. So it can't be PVC, that's a halogenated polymer, for example, but it can be a polymer like PET, polystyrene, ABS, etc. So if you have one sorted polymer that's cleaned. Second exemption, plastic waste almost exclusively consisting of one cured resin or condensation product. Examples of this are urea, formaldehyde, epoxy resins, but again, it has to be one resin or product. It cannot be mixed with other polymers or resins. The third one is plastic waste, almost exclusively consisting of one of a short list of fluorinated polymer waste. And this is a finite list. The other ones are open-ended lists. So there's, uh, I don't want to list them all here. They're a mouthful, but you can find them in the amendments. And finally, there's one exemption that includes a mixture. All the other ones have to be bipolymer. The only mixture allowed is polyethylene, polypropylene, and PET, provided they're destined for separate recycling eventually and are free from contamination and other types of waste. So those are the four categories that will not be controlled in most circumstances. Anything other than the four will be hazardous plastic waste. And this is very rare at the moment, but will become increasingly important because countries are starting to look at the additives and the additives in plastics like POPs are being scrutinized much more carefully and those will qualify more and more plastics in the future as hazardous plastic waste. And those will absolutely be subject to bans and controls. And then waste for special consideration, Annex 2. This is really common, and this is the area that we are mostly talking about as being a dramatic change as of this year. So it's those mixed and contaminated plastic wastes that are not exempt and are not hazardous, which will be subject to new controls. And this is important uh, because this is what almost everything coming out of our municipalities looks like. It comes out separated as plastic, not separated by polymer. It's mixed bales, and these will be considered no-go just by the fact that they're mixed 
they will be considered this new category of Y48 in Annex 2, unless the mixture is just PET, PE, and PP. And we also are looking at e-waste. So these are bales from plastic uh, that I took this picture in Hong Kong a couple of years ago. Typical e-waste or we plastic also has been routinely mixed and also will be no-go. Now you might be asking what is meant by contaminated? And this is a open question and an important one. Uh, exemptions use the terms almost free from contamination and other types of waste. Now that kind of language is legally very strong. Uh, when they say almost free from, uh, it signifies a de minimis, a very, very small amount. So there's been a lot of toing and froing about what that should mean. There is a footnote in the new amendments that says in this respect, international specifications may offer a point of reference. But the only specifications that keep being cited are those produced by the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries. And they are by their own admission, not created for environmental reasons, but for commercial reasons. And so many um, governments are saying those are not going to be applicable. Certainly groups like BAN are saying these are not appropriate to use for environmental treaties and environmental concerns. Already, Hong Kong has set a 0.5%. So it's the first jurisdiction that has really said what they're going to consider as being contamination. Uh, Indonesia has said zero contamination. NGOs globally are saying also 0.5% if it's non-hazardous. And so positions are being developed. The EU uh, draft guidance is now floating the 2% level. And for all intents and purposes, this is likely going to be decided by China, Hong Kong, and the EU as the most important players. So we can predict that it's probably not going to be uh, less than 5%. I mean, not greater than 5%, sorry. So we're looking at what this all means in terms of who can trade with who. Uh, for the non-USA situation, trade not involving USA, looking at Annex 2, Y48, all that mixed and dirty plastic. If it's going from a Basel party to another Basel party, the trade is allowed, but only with prior informed consent. And if it's going from an EU country, the 27 EU countries, and it's going to a non-OECD Basel party, then the trade is banned because the EU, when they implemented the Basel ban amendment, they included Annex 2 together with the hazardous waste. In the US situation, it's quite different. The US being a non-party, if they're going to trade from the U.S. to Basel parties, it's not going to be allowed unless a bilateral agreement exists. And currently, the only one that will work was signed a few months ago with Canada. So the party to non-party ban is really relevant. U.S. is a non-party. So that trade will be technically illegal. Now, it's important to note that the legality or illegality takes place in the Basel parties. So nobody is going to be prosecuted in the US, I'm afraid, for launching such an export, but it'll be on the receiving country where this will be considered criminal trafficking and waste. So um, the US and Canada, you can trade there and it's gonna be a free trade due to the bilateral agreement. They've, they've decided not to have this Annex 2 listing controlled at all. And in the US, going to Basel non-parties, remember there's very few of those. There's only East Timor, Grenada, Haiti, San Marino, South Sudan. So those countries, yeah, you can trade with them, but not advisable. So looking at just a list of where a lot of this waste has been going from the US, these countries will be off limits. And uh, they're not, it's not the full list, but just an example. Now, as I close, I think a lot of people will be wondering, well, what if the US were to ratify the 
the Basel Convention. How would that change things? And it would change things in this way. Exports of Annex II waste, such as that we've been talking about, would be allowed to other Basel parties with prior informed consent. So you could export to Malaysia, for example, if they agreed to it. And the Basel ban amendment would have to be accepted by the US because it's now part of the convention. So this would prevent e-waste, which is a form of hazardous waste from going to non-OECD countries full stop, uh, making non-exporting companies much more competitive. The e-stewards, for example, are recycling program, our certification is not allowed to do this now, and they're having to compete with people that are allowed to export to developing countries their e-waste. And then interesting for recyclers, the U.S. recyclers could finally import waste from other countries legally, for example, with Caribbean countries into the U.S. So to find out more about the new amendments, you can um, go to this site, and you will be able to read them in all their full glory and detail. And now I want to shift gears and have the recyclers respond uh, to the situation and discuss their response to these rules. And first off, I have Craig Thompson coming to us from the UK of FPD Recycling. Go ahead, Craig. <laughs> Yeah, hi there. So, uh, go on to the next slide, uh, Jim. That'd be great. Thank you. So, yeah, the, uh, the as we've uh, Jim's preluded to, the 1st of January, the new regulations came in. And it's fair to say uh, 12 days in, the, there's a lot of confusion in the market, uh, especially in the, in the uh, European recyclers. So, the uh, Malaysian buyers or Chinese buyers are still requesting material from the recyclers. So today, as an example, there's still big demand there. Uh, the confusing element is that uh, permits have been issued for 2021 uh, to accept uh, plastic scrap, just as they have been in previous years. So the recyclers, of course, have got permits. They've got some duty of care, as they have done in the past. And the uh, e scrap plastics, of course, in, in volume are, are relatively low uh, in percentage terms compared to food packaging bottles, et cetera. Um, and they're not perceived as being uh, an issue. It's really what the consumer sees on the television with uh, bottles and food packaging, which are contaminating oceans, et cetera. So, again, causes confusion. Uh, and as we all know, that are involved with these scrap and weed plastics, it's uh, extremely complex. There's lots of different polymer types. And of course, as uh, Jim's just said earlier, there are uh, mixed polymer types which uh, fall in there as well. So, yeah, as, as for the last slide, the, uh, the issue, of course, with these scrap weed plastics is the amount of different polymer types. It's, you know, 10 or more. Uh, a plastic drinking bottle might only be three polymer types, uh, which uh, are allowed for export. The problem with the e scrap weed plastics is the multiple uh, polymer types, which obviously have restrictions. And uh, some countries have already got uh, pops, plastics as hazardous that can't be exported anyway. So with those mixed polymers, it's, it is very difficult to recycle and, and meet the requirements of new uh, regulations. So next slide, Jim, please. So really, the only way uh, uh, you know, we've talked about prior consent, uh, you know, a lot of that did happen in uh, last year in 2020, where the uh, shipper had to get notification from the consignee that the company that you were sending it to in Malaysia that you would actually uh, allow the shipment to happen but now these plastics really are looking at going as uh, TFS the same as sending CRT glass uh, uh, out that material now plastic is classed as red list it's very costly it takes a long time to put in place if uh, anybody's done it for CRT glass you'll know how long that takes and it's not really viable for e-scrap obviously the values are not there in the material um, but you know, solutions do exist in the US now. There's one or two new processes, and equally there are solutions for non-export for being able to treat uh, e-scrap weed plastics in local markets. Next, next slide, Jim. 
So, so, you know, solutions do exist in Europe. There are uh, just last year alone in uh, Poland, Portugal, uh, France, new installations that are able to treat uh, weak plastics, sea scrap plastics in country. In the US and Canada, uh, you know, URT and eCycle have both installed new lines for doing uh, processing these scrap weed plastics. Um, and new technologies now exist. Uh, our company in the UK is now installing X ray separation for uh, e scrap plastics, so not water or density separation, but using X rays, which is new technology. So, again, solutions are existing. Uh, and with this separation, it then allows uh, clean polymer types, which then could be exported. But as we said earlier, there are many mixed polymer types. Okay, so that's a you know, real summary. There are lots of confusion in the market, and uh, really, uh, there's more to sort of come out, I think, over the next week or two as uh, everybody gets to grips with it. Um, you know, there's a lot of exports in the UK to Malaysia or in Europe to Malaysia that are in confusion at the minute as to whether or not they can or, or can't be exported. Okay, thanks, Jim. Thank you, Craig. Uh, we'll save all the questions till the end. And so next up, I've got Steve Wong of Fukutomi Recycling. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to share my thought with everybody here. The first slide is about machinery we have in Hong Kong. We do have a recycling facility in Hong Kong. Next slide, please. Next. So the second one is a shredder. And we do have a washing line in Hong Kong as well to do different kind of plastic. Next, please. On the screen, I showed four different types of e square plastic. Uh, these are the most recycled one, and the first one uh, is computer scrap. And the second one is TV casing. The third one is V shredded plastic material. And the last one is refrigerator recline. Next. In our industry, actually, it's very, very challenging because plastic, especially in e square plastic, we have more than, not less than 50 different types of plastic, and the most recycled them are PEPP, PSABS, and the rest of the residue. Normally, they are PC, PCA based, and also some of the uh, material are compound together with family retardant or other additive. And these are the ones that at this moment are not being recycled with normally uh, account for 50, 60 percent of them. And this next one I want to mention is in recycling of e square plastic, we need really, very really effective sorting system to segregate or separate different kind of plastics especially we do have pop uh, persisting organic pollutants there's the one uh, not allowed to be exported and also nowadays uh, for importation it also has a big concern with most of the importing country and next i go to is even with this automated sorting line like optical or electrostatic separation equipment it still is very costly and also very time consuming. That's why a lot of e square plastic going to the Southeast Asian countries. Next. So the most challenging uh, we have also, from time to time, we always see e square plastic is not really commercially viable when it comes to recycling as especially oil price fluctuate from time to time when the price of oil and prime material price are low it makes no sense or not much sense to recycle uh e square plastic because from time to time the cost of recycling is more than the selling price of the recycled materials so what we are looking for probably an alternative to sell 
our recycled materials not as a cost benefit to the downstream converter. Instead, uh, the use of recycled content is for environmental reason. And now we look at, unless there's an effective sorting system, normally the uh, recycle of e square plastic is very, very challenging, especially when we want to reduce the, the waste limit below 2% in order for export. And the example I give is for e-square plastic, if, if we want to recycle to regrind form for export, at this moment, we need to control the contamination under 2%. And the next thing I look at is export without treatment is almost impossible nowadays under the requirement of the Basel Convention. Next slide, please. Now we look at trade balance. As uh, we see in Southeast Asian country, there are lots of recyclers. And I would say uh, plastic recycler would amount to something 20,000. And all these recyclers today, they are dying for plastic waste for the, to fulfill or to satisfy their, their operations. And especially in e scrap recycling, normally they have very big capacity in order to achieve the economy of scale. And US is one, one of the, or the largest yeast plastic generating countries with the Basel Convention. Again, there's not much we can do unless we recycle them locally to satisfy the requirement. Next slide, please. So how recycler or someone like Fukudomi can meet the challenge? In fact, there's the, uh, no standard uh, answer. What I can think of is we first of all know, or we, we first of all get to know or familiar with the Basel Convention requirement as to what we can export or what we can import. And secondly, we also had to bridge uh, between fellow recyclers to interchange information. Apart from that, we also uh, be possible to partner with the local companies and also encourage recyclers in the Far East or Southeast Asian countries to, to, to process e square plastic domestically in exporting countries. This applies not only US, but also in Europe. And and I think the the, the 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 our industry in the end will be very much focused on recycling uh, locally or recycling a source of supply. And the last thing in this is um, we we need to move all this capacity. As I just mentioned, there are more than twenty thousand recyclers in the Far East, and they can have capacity of six seven million tons per month. That include all the plastic. And we want to use this capacity move to from far east move to developed countries. Next slide, please. So talking about um, going forward. At this moment, uh, we have uh, the Basel Convention uh, amendment, and we also have what we are now facing is the coronavirus and also unstable prices, imbalance, supply and demand, I will call it disconnect of what we have and also what we can recycle in the other part of the world. And, and the, the, the one of the solution is to encourage or to promote sustainability, promoting uh, extended producer responsibility and, and the use of recycled content. For that, we need to have collaboration uh, of government, lawmaker, brand owner, industry, recycler, and the general public. And this is what i like to share with everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks very much. And now we'll move to uh, Jeff Lloyd of URT LLC. Great. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, so I'd like to start just by, uh, by, by one thanking, yeah, that's, that's a good slide there. Um, thanking uh, Craig, uh, you know, this, uh, what I'm gonna talk about, uh, our plastic separation recycling system, 
really started the conversations about three, three and a half years ago. Uh, if you look at the National Sword Initiative in China, it coincided with with uh, with that situation, and uh, uh, Craig's ex ex expertise uh, really helped uh, held our hand to to get this process started. So almost full circle with with uh, him on the call today. Uh, if you've done any work with URT, uh, you, you you hear this from us often that uh, you know, we like to uh, be forward thinking, controlling our destiny. And what, what that really means is the more we can control the products that come out of our systems, uh, the more we think we can decrease volatility in the market. And everyone on this call fully understands that there's a significant volatility in commodity market, uh, particularly around uh, electronics, electronics recycling from a uh, you know, physical processing and, and all the way to, uh, you know, uh, revenue of value. Uh, one of uh, our latest initiative, as you see uh, in this slide, is to, to implement technology that is, it's not, uh, it's not uh, new technology. It's, it's been around for, for quite a while. Uh, it's just not a technology that e-waste companies in the U.S. have decided to invest capital into uh, on a large scale. I, I believe there are only three units in North America now. Uh, with the addition of a couple, uh, including ours, this year. Uh, next slide. Uh, our our, our uh, separation system um, is, is something you've probably seen and heard of before. Uh, it's a three tank system. Um, we obviously have uh, in feed stock that has to be sized. We use other uh, electronic processing equipment for that, uh, shredders metal removers, uh, optical sort units. Uh, once the material is sized, uh, it goes into uh, one of three tanks um, and uh, we use density separation uh, like others uh, in the US and, and around the, the world. Um, from there, well, we do get mixed polymer uh, that uh, is clean of, of metals. Uh, you can see here uh, point number two, you know, it's our, our intent is to sell it domestically. Again, that's just uh, uh, allows us to control our destiny. Uh, reduce some some costs, and uh, it does not mean that it only can be sold uh, domestically. Uh, there are there are outlets, obviously, um, uh, for this material uh, exporting as well. Uh, we can process about th about three tons uh, an hour. Uh, that is uh, essentially what we would generate at our our uh, main facility, and uh, you can see that the, the focus is on uh, the the PS ABS uh, PE and uh, PP. Uh, next slide. Here's just some photos of uh, the end product. Uh, you can see it, it does get uh, granulated and is is clean of of metals. And you know, I will say that this is uh, really just phase one. Uh, we we don't we didn't uh, approach this lightly. Uh, our our ownership and executive team uh, did not uh, uh, approach this lightly three years ago. Uh, adding equipment uh, to do this. Uh, is a significant capital investment and a lot of uh, uh, conversations and decisions have been made based on uh, current and existing markets and then uh, you know essentially a guess as to what's going to happen in the future. Uh, if I feel that uh, we guess right and the timing of installation and operation of this unit uh, it coincides well with the, uh, uh, the new regulation started starting a couple weeks ago. Uh, but this isn't the end. Obviously, we want to be able to process uh, material from all of our facilities within the U.S., and there's multiple. Uh, we want to be able to uh, assist our, our other uh, partner uh, com companies and, and uh, customers that we work with on their volume. And uh, there's a potential of moving forward where there can be additional capitalization of equipment to provide um, you know, single polymer sort and extrusion, which, would, uh, which truly would uh, create an owner on destiny. Next slide. Great. All right. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, that was great. Um, what I want to do next is see if there are any other experiences out there um, from you all. I imagine there's some recyclers in the audience or others that are involved in responding to these new rules. And the way to uh, take the floor, if you are involved, is to raise your hand, and then uh, Angelo will try to operate your mic and uh, have you ask or tell your story. 
This is prior to our questions, so these are just experiences here. Do we have any that people want to share? Yes, so this is Angelo here. Uh, if you have questions um, or would like to share your experience, please raise your hand and I will unmute you and allow you to speak. Uh, looks like we have uh, um, somebody here. Uh, Mark Newton, I will be unmuting you. And you'll just need to unmute yourself there, Mark. There you go. All right, great, thanks. Uh, thanks for the great presentation, guys. And uh, Jim, I've got a question for you when you were reviewing the uh, the, the Basel uh, laws or, or, uh, or protocol requirements. Uh, you, you noted that um, mechanical recycling uh was really sort of the thing that they were uh focused on are there any other types of recycling chemical recycling waste energy or anything like that that are that are uh, under consideration that's an excellent question mark um mechanical recycling is was what was said at uh, cop 14 but actually the the document the actual minutes refer to r3 which is recycling that's not incineration or waste to energy. So it's a recycling of organic materials. And so it's uh, it's quiet, it's agnostic about whether it's chemical recycling, which is somewhat of a new thing, or whether it's mechanical. Now, there is a debate as to whether the, they're going to redefine R3, because there is a process looking at all the annexes right now, to just ex keep it exclusively mechanical because that's what was in most people's minds. But of course, the chemical recycling advocates are wanting to keep R3, um, including that as well. But what is can be said uh, definitively is this is not going to be allowed. These exemptions will not be allowed to go to waste to energy or incineration. Angela, looks like we have uh, Mr. Zhang. Yeah, let me unmute Mr. Jang here. You have been unmuted, Mr. Jang. You will just have to unmute yourself. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, it's, it's really a very good opportunity to participate in this webinar. I just want to quickly introduce myself and my company. Uh, we operate a company called the Bowman Polymer Solution Inc. in Brantford, Ontario, Canada, so which is uh, about 40 minutes drive from the U.S. and Canada border at the Buffalo site. So within this facility, we started this project about two and a half years ago. We had some challenging time on the production, everything. So we actually started uh, the full production several months back. So we are we have a several part of the process, which is the first is a floating sink. Uh, from our understanding, it will be most likely still unlikely to export materials, even you have a simple floating sink process. So over here in our plant, we have eight tanks. Uh, it's a really comprehensive system. And after that, we have uh, electrostatus line process single polymer and then from there uh, we have actually two extruding line palletizing line pretty one or uh, one focus on ps and if the other one primarily focus on abs so this is what we've been doing and as of now we are taking majority shredded plastic which is a kind of a headache i'm sure both crack and dr wang know this pretty well uh, and uh, we, are, we are watching on the belt CRT plastically uh, plastic hopefully we will get into that very soon when the market is more stabilized so this is our uh, story I, as, as far as we know we are probably one of the very few companies uh, focus on the remanufacture using the shredded plastic in Canada and the northeast part of the states Thank you. All right, Mr. Shang, thank you. It's really good to hear that there are North American operators 
uh, that are getting organized to sort and separate the plastics uh, domestically in North America. So it looks like we have uh, Brian Shook. Brian Shook, I will be unmuting you. Uh, yeah, you are... hi. thank you. I was just wondering what the name of that company was in Brantford, Ontario. Yes, I missed it too. So uh, unmute Mr. Shang again. <laughs> Give me one moment here. Uh, Mr. Jank, you are unmuted. Yep, sure. The company name called BOMET, B-O-M-E-T, uh, is a BOMET Polymer Solutions, Inc. So Very we good. have a couple other sister companies all in the recycling side in a one in, the other one in Ontario as well, and then we do have another one in Buffalo, New York. Thank you. Very good. Okay, does anybody else have um, experience they want to share in this regard of services that are operational that can help respond to these new rules? Just raise your hand and I will be able to unmute you afterwards. If not, we'll go ahead and open it up to uh, all types of questions you may have for any or all of the participants, all of the presenters. So go ahead and raise your hand, or if you'd like, you can ask the question in the chat and we will read it aloud. Uh, so we had a question here from Sarah Murray. Uh, it is a few questions. Uh, the first thing, how is this going to be enforced? How will US state program regulators be able to tell if a recycler is complying and are you aware of any legitimate recycling markets for e-plastics with BFRs? Wow. Um, I'll answer the first two, and then we'll see if um, my other panelists can answer the last one about BFRs. So the way international law is usually enforced is by the countries involved. So the parties are charged with enforcing the rules, and they have them in their own national legislation. But I'm afraid because of the second part of your question, you're referring to the United States. And the United States, not being a Basel party, doesn't have these rules in their national legislation. And so I'm afraid there will be no enforcement. Of course, we really want to communicate as quickly as possible with the Biden administration to see if we can do something about that. Already, we're talking to various states uh, to see what they can do. Uh, states are challenged by our own constitution in the United States of, of affecting international trade, but they can do certain things like make it very transparent what's going on and not give recycling credits for exports that are violating international law and that sort of thing. So we're in dialogue, for example, in California on how they can find ways to enforce this new international law and not get caught out with uh, criminal trafficking. Because as I mentioned, even though it's considered criminal trafficking, and as soon as this, these exports from the US are on the high seas, uh, Interpol will be alerted and the importing countries will be alerted. There's nothing in the US law that prevents this from happening. So it is a problem for enforcement in the US. So we got another question here, and this, there's one in the chat from uh, Peter Hungary. Yep. Um, the question from Peter Hungry is, what is the understanding regarding the W Triple E exported as whole with electronics and plastics intact? B1110 list B, waste contained in the annex will not be waste covered by Article 1, Paragraph 1A of this convention unless they contain Annex 1 material to an extent causing them to exhibit an NX3 characteristic. Can the mixed plastic yeah. part? Yeah, so if the, it's, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, just can the mixed plastic part in the WEEE be considered as Annex 1 material? If I understand the question, um, the question is about electronic waste. 
And electronic waste is generally considered to be hazardous waste because almost invariably it has some kind of circuitry in it. And the circuitry usually has enough lead or uh, brominate flame retardants in the circuit board to trigger it being a hazardous waste. So with few exceptions, most electronic waste is considered hazardous waste. So it's on the A list and not the B list. And of course the B list is the exception to that. Uh, but if it's uh, whole electronics, and of course there's plastic in there with circuitry, uh, most regulators are going to see that as electronic waste uh, with that listing of A1180. And they're not going to consider it as a plastic waste listing because that would be the more rigorous controls would be for the hazardous waste. I hope that answers your question. If you have more of a nuanced uh, question on that, I didn't get the answer to surely send it my way after the uh, webinar. We have a, another question uh, from uh, Finso. Uh, they say, Minmar is not assigned for ban amendment yet. Are OECD countries uh, needed to uh, oblique the ban amendment for their country? Yeah, if I understand the question, Myanmar has not ratified the Basel Ban Amendment, but they have ratified the Basel Convention. And the Ban Amendment is part of the convention now. So any uh, country that's in the OECD is forbidden to export to Myanmar. Uh, so all of the developed countries, except for the United States, are in the Basel Convention, and um, they would be forbidden to export hazardous waste. And with respect to these new listings, they would have to use prior informed consent. But if they're in the EU, they would have a full ban. So EU countries would not be able to export to Myanmar under any circumstances these new plastics. But a country like Canada could with the consent of Myanmar. Great. Uh, we have a question here from Thomas uh, Hoyt. Uh, with separation by water, how is that water treated to prevent plastic from being discharged in the wastewater? Would be prohibitively expensive in the states where this is considered treatment? Question mark. Yeah, I'm hoping someone in our panel could ans help answer this and also answer the question which I forgot, which was about markets for BFR plastics. Yeah, this is Jeff uh, with URT. Uh, I'll, I'll just address the, uh, uh, if you heard the question, um, the, the separation um, with, with density. Uh, so I, I won't, I won't uh, divulge what, uh, you know, proprietary uh, solution uh, we use, but, uh, um, you could probably Google it and and uh, find the find the solution. Um, the different uh, liquids, uh, obviously different densities, and and uh, plastics will tend to sink or float depending on what the density is. And does anybody have an answer to the question of BFR plastic markets? Craig? Yeah. yeah, hi there, Jim. So, yeah, in answer to the question on the BFR, the uh, UK government actually last year put an export ban on all uh, we e scrap plastics containing BFRs or persistent organic pollutants, POPs. So, the only way of treating BFRs uh, under the UK regulations is through incineration, is high temperature incineration, uh, preferably with waste to energy attached. So recovery targets can still be met on the BFR uh, part of the plastics. So in, in brief, uh, incineration, a high temperature incineration is the only way really for the BFR. So no real markets in the UK. Um, anybody no, have anything to add to that? Well, under UK regs, it has to be uh, destroyed. It has to be uh, right. incinerated. Yeah. Okay, do we have any more questions about yeah, we have any of this? Handful of questions still. Um, we have, um, hold on a second here. Uh, we have Tracy Grissman asking, uh, when do you think the US will join the Basel Convention? 
<laughs> well, I've, I've learned not to hold my breath. Um, I've been through a lot of administrations since 1989, and we all have, and neither Republican or Democrat administrations have ever achieved this. And now it's getting really glaring. Uh, and in particular, because of plastics becoming a hot issue at Basel and now being controlled by Basel, maybe there will be a new impetus. Uh, I hope so. And the reason I hope so is now the ban amendment is part of the treaty. Uh, they will, the US will have to accept that and not export hazardous waste to developing countries anymore. And this problem of uh, not having, you know, implementing legislation and enforcement will be solved as well. So it would be very important that the US does that. I'm hoping we can get that done in this next administration. Uh, but there are forces that push back against it. A lot of uh, the industry, unfortunately, has been against the ba Basel Convention since the beginning, and they hold a lot of sway in uh, Capitol Hill. But we shall see. Um, I can't give a prediction, and I, uh, again, won't hold my breath. <clears throat> Any more? Uh, yeah, we have a few questions here. Uh, you have some reminders up there, Jim. You might want to close them down. Um, we have a question here from Colin Saab. Do you have an estimate of how much e-plastic is exported from the U.S.? I'm curious how much material will be potentially be displaced and be looking for domestic outlets. Yeah, um, I don't have an estimate, uh, but I know for a fact, and I'm sure uh, Jeff and others in the industry know that it's been very common to export the plastics to countries like Malaysia until this year. Um, and indeed, uh, a lot of that was allowed under the e-steward standard uh, until these new amendments were adopted. And then e-stewards as a group of recyclers also considered those to be a hazardous uh, waste controlled by a ban to developing countries. Uh, so we kind of went ahead of the Basel Convention official date of, of this year, January 1. But other recyclers have been sending everything to Asia. And uh, I wonder if uh, Jeff would like to comment or any of the other recyclers, Steve or uh, Craig. Yeah, I would like to comment on this point. At this moment, I see there are lots of e square waste plastic going to the Far East. And normally, or in most of the cases, especially going to Thailand, uh, people don't use the proper HS code. So it's very, very difficult to have a real number. And as you know, Thailand uh, forbidden importation of plastic scraps. And also in other country, uh, there's always a saying that whatever you can put in a container, regardless of what you're going to put as a HS code, the other side of the world can always recycle them. So I don't think we really get a number on this, but I know it's a lot. When I say it's a lot, means in terms of like probably a thousand tons or to up to a million tons per year. Yeah, it's very difficult to get precise figures, particularly on uh, on e-plastics, electronic waste plastics. The tariff codes don't correspond to that, and there's an incentive for people not to use the proper tariff codes to avoid uh, signaling concerns with customs officials. So the normal ways of getting that data through the tariff code system and the ComTrade compilation of it uh, is not accurate. Any more questions? Uh, yes. Uh, we have a comment here, actually, from Hannah. Uh, they say, hello, I am from the English Environment Agency, and I can say that we are enforcing the Basel Convention in full by stopping containers, and eventually we will prosecute if necessary. 
that's more Excellent. of a comment, but Anna, uh, in the past, the UK has been um, one of the top countries in Europe in terms of enforcement of the waste shipment regulation. So I want to congratulate them on that. Um, today, we did put out a press release um, noting that the UK, unlike the EU, uh, is going to allow the export of this Y48 category with prior informed consent. Again, I said the EU had banned it going to developing countries. The UK is going to allow it. I was not happy with that. Basel Action Network and other environmental groups not happy, but we hope that the UK will join the EU in banning these plastic wastes to non-OECD countries and maybe even go further and ban all plastic waste, to, as they've indicated in a recent uh, manifesto. So um, that's just the side uh, about the situation in the UK. You have a Any question more? here. We yeah. have a handful of questions. Um, we got so Kitan at the top with their hand raised too. We have uh, Kitan here with how will the extended producer responsibility aligned with the new rules and the plastic waste. And I'm going to unmute you. Oh, looks like they put their hand down, but feel free to answer that. Yeah, right now, um, the EPR laws are not in place for most plastics, and uh, they are being proposed in various fora. Uh, so we shall see if we get extended producer responsibility on all of these different types of plastics. Uh, in Europe, they're doing some of that. Of course, they're ahead of the game, but the plastics uh, waste movement is looking very seriously at imposing a very comprehensive extended producer responsibility on plastic packaging, uh, for example. And of course, for electronic waste in some fora, like in the EU, there is extended producer responsibility. In some states in the US for certain products, there's also producer responsibility, which impacts the plastics, which are part of the equipment. But um, to answer the question in summary is people are looking at expanding the EPR concept for plastics uh, dramatically. It's not there yet. We have a question here from Angelina. Uh, they say, hello, thank you for the excellent webinar. I am wondering if Canada, Turkey, and China, not having signed the plastic amendment yet, are still considered Basel parties. As I understand, this is relevant regarding the export from Basel parties. Thank you. Wow, um, very good question. Uh, those three countries, and you know, I don't have the precise answer, but I know that Canada um, has now signed and they did it very recently. So in the Basel Convention, an amendment like this doesn't have to be accepted if somebody raises their hand and says, we don't um, want to implement this yet. If they don't do that, it, it automatically gets implemented. So those were the three countries that said, we're not ready. But China and Turkey have assured me, as did Canada, that it's just a matter of timing, that they want to do it. So they may have already done it. I know that Canada has. I haven't checked recently with Turkey and China. But to answer your question, they will still be considered Basel parties no matter what. But every country has the right not to accept an amendment if they wish to. Great. Um, we have a question here from John. And this question is for the panel. Uh, how would you handle and pass the audit for plastic verification process? This question is for who? Uh, the panel. Oh, okay. What, um, I'm not sure of the question, which verification process are we referring to? I'm not sure. Um, John has asked uh, this question is for the panel. How do you handle and pass the audit for plastic verification process? If you could explain that a little more, John, uh, we would be happy to answer that. 
Um, they do have a question, particularly for URT. Uh, will the separated plastic be 100% recyclable? And if not, what happens to the unrecyclable product? Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. Um, so uh, we've already discussed, you know, what plastics uh, don't have a recycling market. Uh, so obviously, um, we'll be generating those, uh, uh, you know, uh, polymers as well. So it, it, they're not 100% recycled. It's just not possible um, in, in the current market. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, except for a few exceptions, the answer is yes. And where do they go then, uh, Jeff? Uh, incineration. It's the only option, uh, as Craig just, uh, described. And we do have a follow-up question in terms of incineration that aligns with this. Uh, someone has asked, what temperature is required for plastic incineration, depending on the plastic type, I guess? Does anybody have the answer to that one? Because I think it depends on which jurisdiction, but um, perhaps Craig knows the, the yeah, uh, can I, regulations. Can I can't give you the exact one, and I'd, I'd get it wrong as well because it'd be in centigrade rather than Fahrenheit. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it is definitely high uh, high temperature incineration, uh, and you really you'd need that attached to uh, waste to energy, um, so that you're actually generating. Uh, heat or power from it, so you can actually use that as part of your recovery target. So a normal uh, municipal incinerator is, is no good. Uh, unfortunately, the plastics have got a lot of uh, chlorine uh, and other hazards in. So you, again, the incinerator needs to be of a particular uh, type that the filters can scrub the uh, chlorine from the plastic when it's incinerated. Thank you. Um... We have a few more questions. Um, one is by Maria. Uh, they ask, since the OECD countries have decided that the US is out of scope despite Article 11 and cannot trade Y48 plastic with us, will this eventually be extended to all materials covered by the Basel Convention uh, circuit board going from the US to South Korea? Question mark. Yeah, so this gets into a very interesting side story. Uh, where after these amendments were adopted, the US at the OECD level uh, protested and said, we don't want the OECD to adopt these new controls on Y48, for example. And uh, they said, we object. And so usually the OECD agreement, which is a trade agreement for recyclables within the OECD countries to trade among themselves, usually the default is they automatically accept the Basel definitions. The US protested, and as a result of the protest, Y48 is no longer part of the OECD agreement, which means that if anybody in the OECD wants to trade in Y48, they can't use that agreement. So they have to go back and use their Basel uh, agreement. Now, the US, by doing that protest, shot themselves in the foot because they lost a lot of trading partners for Y48, which is why they had to rush and sign a bilateral agreement with Canada. Uh, but I think the protest by the US really backfired on them. But the question was, is this going to happen with a lot of other waste? I don't think so unless the US again objects to a listing in the OECD, and I doubt they'll object to the ones that are already listed. So it was just um, a strange little nuance that the US is no longer allowed to trade with OECD countries like Turkey, like Europe, in this new mixed and dirty plastic category. Great. Um, we have a question from Eugene. Uh, they asked, can the US ship electronic plastics to Malaysia with Malaysian consent. Electronic plastic to Malaysia? The US yeah, is not, Malaysian the US, consent. that trade between the US and Malaysia will be illegal. 
because the U.S. is a non-party, but the illegality, the prosecution of that criminal trafficking will have to take place in Malaysia, not in the U.S. Great. Uh, we have a few more questions, about six more. Um, what role can companies and manufacturers play, particularly on e-waste, and the evident program obsolescence of consumer electronic goods, i.e. computers, cell phones, tablets. What role can manufacturers play? Uh, I think we still have a manufacturer on the call, if Mark Newton is still here. Um, we obviously want manufacturers to get rid of the toxicity first and foremost. Uh, to do everything they can to enhance collection of the non-toxic waste. Uh, that, that's one of the biggest problems with plastics is they're inherently not valuable, not very valuable. And so therefore their collection is difficult and uh, everything they can do to ensure the collection. And of course, as was mentioned by Steve, uh, for those plastics that need to be produced that are durable, long-lived plastics, um, we need to have um, means to, to ensure that they are recycled by putting post-consumer plastic into products. So unless there's a need for post-consumer recyclable plastics, unless they're used, they're not going to be any reason to recycle them. So we have to make sure that we can compete with the low price of oil compete with virgin plastic. And um, the other point I would make when I forgot to mention is that we as a society are gonna have to get out of the business of making so much plastic. And we'll start with the single use plastic. So anything manufacturers can do to eliminate single use plastics, including packaging is extremely important. We should only be creating plastics which are durable, have a long life and have a good safe recycling prospect. Yeah, yeah mind me sort of adding to that, Jim. Yeah, I mean, uh, in, in answer to the question from a, a recyclers perspective, I'm sure Jeff would re reiterate this as well. The problem that we have as a recycling industry is the OEMs, the manufacturers, not using recycled polymer in new product. So, I mean, in Europe alone, we import 1.2 billion euros of virgin polymer annually to manufacture product. Uh, and it's the issue is uh, finding sustainable um, local markets for using recycled polymer in new product. That that would be a, a huge win. Yeah. Well, listen, we've gone uh, over time here, and I'm happy to keep going with the questions. But before we do that, um, just to let everyone know that hasn't logged off yet, that we will post this on the BAN website. So you go into the BAN website library, you will see this posted in a few hours after we have the program finished. Um, so feel free to do that. And also anytime, send us questions in writing if you wish. But uh, so feel free to log off if you're not interested in the more, any more questions, but we'll stay put here and answer the questions until at least uh, uh, the uh, next 20 minutes or so I can do that. So, any more? And so this webinar will be sent to your emails afterwards, and uh, you'll be able to access it. Um, we do have a question for Jeff. Uh, the question for Jeff is, do you separate polymers? And two, what is the output of your process? And three, if you're able to, who is it sold to? Uh, so I'll start with the last one. Uh, I'm, I'm not at the liberty to divulge uh, our downstream uh, partners. Uh, we do separate polymers, but they are still mixed. Um, um, it's not uh, individual uh, polymers that come out of the system. What was the second part as well? Uh, the second part is what is the output of your process? Right. Yeah. So essentially, it's a, a granulated mixed uh, polymer. Um, we have a question here from Lisa. Can you explain when to use Basel code B3011 versus A3011? Uh, 
3210 when exporting these plastics. Okay, there's actually um, three categories. There's the hazardous plastics, and that's the A list. There's the non-hazardous, that's the B list. And then there's everything else. And that is Y48, Annex 2 list. And um, you would use the A list if there's something in the plastic, like a brominated flame retardant, which qualifies it as a hazardous waste. So um, you would have to look further into Basel and see if it's got an Annex 1 constituent and an Annex 3 characteristic at the same time, and then it would be a hazardous waste. You would check with your authorities to see if they agreed that that's a hazardous waste to see if you had concurrence on that. Uh, but that's a rare plastic. Right now, it will become increasingly common, but right now, uh, it's mainly the brominated flame retardant plastics that are being triggered in certain jurisdictions. Uh, what's going to be more com common is the Y48. And if it's not an exempted, those four categories I mentioned that are the exemptions, it has to be clean pretty much and um, down to a single polymer with one exception of a mixture. Uh, but if it is those, if it's clean and single polymer, then it's going to be the B list. So it'll be non-hazardous. On our website, we have a decision tree which might help you answer your question that you can find on the BAN website. Uh, this takes you through, you know, is it this or is it that? And you have a decision tree to see which way to go. But uh, just to be clear, most plastics that are recovered today are going to fall in the Y48 category. Just because the market has not been geared up to separate and clean to the degree that's going to be required with these new rules. So almost everything which I showed in those two pictures uh, that's being collected by the e-waste uh, recyclers or by municipalities is going to be controlled as Y48 Annex 2. Great. Uh, we have Anthony. Um asking a question here. What would be the impact of all these amendments on African countries? Wow, um, good question. The uh, EU will not be able to export any of these mixed and dirty plastics to African countries because they're all non-OECD. Uh, the trade with the US will not be able to take place legally. So uh, you'll have to be vigilant to make sure you're not getting anything from the US, but it will be illegal. There's also uh, the Bamako Convention, which is an African treaty, which would, if you read it, it says that all plastics are banned from, all plastic waste, I should say, are banned to import into Bamako parties. And so the countries in Africa that are part of the Bamako Convention, I think there's some 20 uh, parties that are part of the Bamako Convention already, they would not be able to bring in any plastic waste into Africa. So, any more, Angela? Um, we just have one question from Katan, and this is the last question I see here. Uh, what okay. options are for plastic recycling? I'm so, say it again. Uh, what options are left for plastic recycling? Well, I would uh, turn it over to my panel. Uh, there's still quite a lot of plastics that are being recycled, but obviously the industry is going to have to make serious adjustments to the way it's been doing business. And um, that goes from the manufacturers all the way down to the recyclers, the waste hauling industry, everyone in the chain of disposition of plastics and their manufacturer is going to have to make some some adjustments to maximize uh, appropriate recycling. But I'll let um, see if any of our panelists also have some answers to that question. Hi, I just like to comment on this point. For me, I'm. As a recycler, I've been in this business for more than 26, 27 years. We have been facing lots of regulatory changes for the last, I would say, 10 years, ever since the Green Fence Initiative. 
on, on one hand, uh, we know that uh, there are a lot of challenges, not only the regulation or regulatory, regulatory changes, as well as market force. And on the other hand, we know that uh, recycling is the future. As what Jim just said, we had to adjust ourselves to cope with the changes. And, and I hope uh, traditionally people buy recycled material because of economic reason, because they can blend with other material or because they can make their product cheaper to be more competitive. And as from now and what we experience and what we already seen and also discuss, uh, recycled content is getting very popular nowadays and it's a matter of time whether uh, uh, this recycled content from packaging plastic waste uh, eventually, one of these days, you will go to different stream of plastic waste like e scrap or from carpet or from many other uh, plastic industry. So uh, the, the future is lay on the, 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 the mandatory use of recycled content. And we hope one day our downstream converter or, or manufacturer, they buy plastic not only because of the price, in fact, it's getting more and more expensive in terms of like cost of production. So they, they buy or they use recycled contents because of uh, environmental reason or because of the regulatory uh, requirements. And I still believe uh, recycling is something for the future and also for now with regards to some of the recycled materials. And um, yeah, that's why I'm still here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the recycling is is always going to be part of our waste management strategy and a very important part of it. We just have to do it right. We have to do it safely and we can't make it the only solution. Uh, so much more has to go into the front end of designing products, not using single use plastics that are inherently wasteful and non circular. Um, but yeah, recycling is going to play an important role for a long time to come. So with that, I think um, if we didn't get to your question, just send it on and you can see how to contact us in this slide. And we will be sending you an email, as Angela said, with a link to this presentation. And once again, I wanna thank you all for joining us at whatever time zone and whatever part of the world you're coming to us from. We thank you very, very much. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.